Well, hello. My name is Scott Claus, and uh, welcome to the Claus Clubhouse here, um, Animation Clubhouse. Uh, I'm going to be your guide for the next couple hours uh, for anyone who cares to join me and uh, talk a little bit about animation, and specifically 2D animation. That's what we're talking about today, although I've done both traditional, they call it traditional 2D animation, we call it, kind of call it traditional now because it's mixing worlds. Um, but uh, traditional animation and uh, 3D animation are both um, welcome on the uh, forefront. Looks like I may be having a little bit of a problem here with the um, frame ranges, so I'm going to cancel it out and try it again. Just bear with me here. Oh, that looks better, hopefully. Anyway, as I was saying, welcome. And um, for anybody who's joined me before, uh, welcome back. Anybody who's new, um, welcome for the first time. So the, the way it works is I'm going to be working on a theme. And uh, part of um, what we do here at CG Spectrum is work on different um, disciplines. And some are more digital. Uh, digital intensive and some of them are more um, kind of what we used to call analog or or what we call now analog what we used to call just drawing and painting and that sort of thing artistic but um, yeah tonight I'm going to be drawing uh, working on this animation cat that I started last week that was uh, um, this kind of a Disney style cat and I'm just going to jump right into it start drawing today I don't think I have any examples of it um, to share today because uh, mostly today I want to just sort of draw and then talk a little bit about um, some things near and dear to my heart in terms of animation and then as usual feel free to chime in if you have any questions or thoughts or anything you'd like to uh, discuss. Um, that's always fair game as well. We are cool and you're nice uh, and uh, if it's animation related all the better. Uh, but um, welcome, John Skull. It's going pretty well. <laughs> it's going all right tonight, uh, today, tonight, wherever you are. Um, how are you doing? Hope you're doing well. Uh, so I am just going to jump right into it and start working on my scene that I started last week. And uh, I'll play it a little bit um, while I talk about it. What The story so far um, is just basically this is a scene that I developed for one of the lessons uh, in at the CG Spectrum in the 2D animation department. So this is what uh, you call a classic take. I talked a lot about this last week. In fact, I went on and on and on about it. So if you're interested in knowing what a classic take is, uh, in character animation terms, um, feel free to check that out if you want an in-depth answer. But the, the bottom line is it's just a change of reaction and usually happens with surprise or shock or um, you know, any number of things is being startled. As you can see, that's what's happening with my cat character right now, which is kind of designed off of the Aristocats, kind of, uh, not really. Uh, one thing that I always tell people who want to copy specific styles is, you know, those styles were developed over long periods of time. Um, I used to be much better at copying the Disney style, just doing my best here, uh, and mostly doing it just for fun. Uh, but uh, anyway, this is a an example of a take that I'm working on. So I'm going to just be fleshing that out tonight, drawing on this scene as I continue to talk about all sorts of things. I'm going to actually start right about here. This looks like a pretty nice place to start. Just fleshing in the drawings, fleshing out the drawings, drawing more drawings. And those of you who have ever experimented with animation, specifically 2D, you know that it takes a really long time. And uh, I try not to spend too much time doing things that are not that exciting to watch uh, when I'm doing these live streams. But this, I thought, man, might be kind of relaxing. It's been a busy day in the States, and uh, maybe people might appreciate just having somebody sit and draw tonight <laughs> or today, wherever you are. Uh, anyway, good to hear it, John Skull. Yeah, it's been a minute and a half for me, so <laughs> congratulations. Um, all right, so I'm going to introduce a new drawing by creating an empty drawing. And then I don't talk about procedures too much, but uh, I turn on Alt and O. And by doing that, I get this thing called Onion Skin, 
bonus points if anybody out there knows what onion skin is. You guys know what that is? Other than something that maybe smells foul, um, maybe you know what onion skin is. Uh, and if you don't, I'm going to tell you anyway, so I just wait in suspense. But um, yeah, so basically what I'm doing is, is uh, using onion skin, which gives me the ability to look at more than one drawing at a time. In fact, I can look at two drawings, the one that's before the one I want to do and the one that's after the one that I want to do. And then I'm trying to do an in-between. I'm doing lots of in-betweens tonight as I flesh this out and get it ready to be cleaned up so it'll look all nice and pretty soon, one day. Um, so in order to be able to see the in-betweens, I have to have a tool that, that makes it so that the drawings are partially um, uh, invisible, <laughs> basically. So the opacity is turned down uh, so that they're partially opaque and partially not too much. And then I have to determine uh, where the in-between goes, and I'll just demonstrate that and talk about it a little bit. Um, but I'm just going to do this over and over and over today. And uh, what usually happens is I go through and I do a rough animation pass, um, which starts out with the key poses, which I was doing last week, and then I start breaking it down, which is what I'm doing it this week. I've already done charts. You may be able to see that over here on the right side of my screen. Charts just basically means I've uh, got drawing number nine, I'm going towards 17, and uh, I've already done 11, which is a breakdown between those two, and it was halfway. And then now I'm doing number 10, I think. They're roughly thereabouts, somewhere in there, yeah. Um, no, I'm actually doing number 13 today. <laughs> so I've already done 10 and 11, so 13, I'm going to do a halfway point between 11 and 17. And then after that, I'll do one more. And by doing that, I am able to create slow ins and slow outs and change the timing of my scene so that uh, it doesn't constantly move at the same speed. Big issue with animation, specifically people who are just getting started, is that their animation looks very even. It looks like it's running at the same speed the whole time. But this system, uh, the way I've set it up anyway with these charts, I have got it so that um, it's slowing down as it gets to a specific key point, and then it's going to speed up again a little bit. So uh, a lot of that was already worked out um, in my animation. So tonight I'm just sitting back and relaxing and using the charts that I already set up uh, and creating the in-betweens based on the roadmap of the charts that I have here on the screen right now. So I'm just going to start sketching. Looks like I got something from... Uh, you got something on your mind, drawn skull. You have a question. Can you please tell me the difference between the 2D animation diploma and the advanced 2D animation diploma? Oh, that's a great question. You fed right into that one um, because it's something that we're uh, talking about. Does one teach more than the other? Because you're thinking about taking both, don't want to take both if not necessary. Well, I will never say that something's necessary or not necessary, uh, but I, I know what you're asking and I'm going to answer it. So basically what we've done is we've broken up the 2D animation program into two separate disciplines because that's what they are, uh, these two programs that we've got going. And I'm just going to use visual aids because who among us isn't visual. Um, so in the first program, uh, we draw a lot. And so that's what I'm doing a lot. Uh, tonight, you know, that's what I usually do on the streams. I keep promising I'm going to take one of the rigs from our classes and uh, show you guys the digital way of animating, which is using drawn rigs. Um, but I haven't done it yet, so watch this space. Um, I'm going to get to it eventually, maybe sooner than later, but uh, not tonight. Um, but anyway, the second way of animating in 2D that is relatively new is the rigged version of 2 2D animation. And what that means is basically if this cat that I've drawn, if, it, if I wanted to do it with um, the kind of traditional advanced 2D cutout, whatever you want to call it, then I would have this drawing and then I would have uh, a rig inside of it. And the rig would be broken up into individual joints that replicate you know, kind of how your joints work in your body. And then each one of these joints would have a control on it and that control can be rotated. So I can rotate it left and right. And by doing so, then I can have the character lift up its arm. Um, I can have the head you know, rotate back and forth. 
Um, it, but it's all side to side. It's all in 2D. It's um, an orthographic view. It's a fancy word for saying that there are no dimensions to it. It only has, uh, it's a flat dimension. Um, and so it can only go left and right, up and down. And there are pluses and minuses to it all. And so people say, well, does that make it faster? Does that make it easier? Listen, if it makes it faster and easier, then it's not going to look that cool. So you can just shake that off right away and not think in terms of faster and easier and think more in terms of well, what is it I'm trying to do. So think about, um, and maybe John Skull, maybe you can think of some TV animation that you've seen. I'm trying to think of anything that's uh, recent that I could mention, um, but a lot of um, animated shows, television shows that are animated um, that you see on TV. Uh, those will be animated with this rig style, with this cutout style, like a character. And instead of having them walk, you know, there you go. We came here to see like high end animation, right? And I'm doing stick figures. But instead of having uh, a fully rendered character, then you've got one that, that's set up, you know, so it can only do specific things. So this character, wow, it's really lousy. Um, this character is, uh, you know, capable of doing uh, only a couple things. You could rotate the legs, you could rotate the arms, you could rotate the heads, and sometimes they call it puppet style animation, and sometimes it's rigged, sometimes it's cutouts. Um, but all that can happen is the legs and the arms can be rotated this way, and then that's how you create animation. Now, there's also the puppet pins. If anybody's ever worked with After Effects. And that's where you could stick uh, virtual pins inside of a character. And whenever I've put pins in, um, those are points of articulation that you can then use um, to uh, create animation and get parts of the body to move. And it looks kind of rubbery and gelatinous. And uh, that's an option. It's just something that you can do, uh, another way of animating things. Um, but they're two really different disciplines. And so uh, a lot of people were finding who are interested in the hand-drawn animation style, which is, again, what I'm doing right now with this cat, where I'm drawing every frame or every couple of frames. Um, that's It's very labor-intensive. It's very uh, complicated. It requires that you know how to draw. It requires an artistic sensibility uh, and um, can be daunting for people who don't like to draw or who aren't interested in drawing. You're creating motion one frame at a time or two or four. Um, using individual drawings. By contrast, the other style, um, the rigged style of drawing or cutout, uh, you have a rig that's set up and all you have to do is animate the arms up and down, but it's very technical. So I'll write that in big scary letters. Um, it can be a little bit daunting for people who don't have a technical mind and don't think in terms of uh, things like uh, kinematics and how you'd set up a rig that's based on a skeletal system that uh, you know has articulated points and then those points animate then you set keyframes and then the computer in betweens it for you and how to make it look realistic anyway even though you've got that kind of constraint working against you so if you're interested in the class number one we ask you to take the hand-drawn class first um, because that's where we offer up things like the 12 principles and the basics of squash and stretch. And then the advanced program, uh, once you've finished up with that, the advanced program you learn how to create your own animation rigs and how to um, make them animate and then what to do with them. So it's a lot of the same ground, bouncing balls, quadruped walks, things like that. But it's a lot more of an emphasis on, on, emphasis on the technical side of things. And then uh, the, then the third term of that is actually a portfolio term where you just put everything you've done in the classes together and create a portfolio that you could then ship out and try to use to try and get a job. You can do that at any time. Um, you can put your work together and uh, you know come up with a portfolio. But uh, what we really focus on that, if you've made it through two terms of 2D animation, the hand-drawn and the uh, cutout animation, as we call it, um, you really have a lot of a big, a large body of work, and at that point, you can really pick and choose what you want for a portfolio, and how you want to uh, focus when you send your stuff out. So um, it's a lot of words to talk about a simple question, but it is kind of a complicated question, and it's hard to answer it.
in a succinct way. Um, but uh, yeah, anyway, that's the difference between the two programs and the one feeds into the other. And uh, uh, so think about it, you know, do you want to draw more? Do you want to do rigs? And um, do you want to work in TV animation? Because that's what you'd be learning to do with the second program with the cutouts. So anyway, if that answers your question, great. If it doesn't, keep asking. I'm here for the next couple hours. So. Um, Riz one, me, Riz, I never know how to say this, Riz, animation. Uh, do you like the cartoon cat? Great. Yeah, it's actually based on uh, O'Malley the Alley Cat from the Aristocats. So, uh, but yeah, Top Cat's cool. If I just put, I don't remember how that went, if I put like a hat on it and then cut out the eye holes, that would be like Top Cat. That's awesome. I'm glad you remember that one. It's nice to know some of those characters still are around. So, very cool. All right, so let me dive into this. I'm going to start drawing while I'm chatting, but uh, please feel free to uh, keep asking questions. Uh, that's one of my main joys of these um, sessions is when you guys ask me stuff and the things that I can answer and help you with. It's, it's always a pleasure. This is a regular course, the drawing course. Yeah, so the regular one, the first one is the drawing course. And then the, the advanced one, which we also call True Digital, I believe. Um, that one is the one that's uh, more of the rigged stuff. And what's funny too is, is um, that what we're finding is, is not that they, you should let this influence you in any way, but we're finding that people who want to take the first course are generally people considered more interested in the artistic quality of animation. And they, they generally kind of want to just learn how to do it. Whereas people who are interested in the, the uh, cutouts, they're more inclined to be interested in getting a job quick in uh, cutout animation, like working on television shows. And before you jump and hit the button and go, well, yeah, that's me. Yeah, I want to get a job. No, I mean, we're always trying to get you guys jobs. That's, that's kind of what CG Spectrum's philosophy is, is to try and train people to get work. Um, but the 2D... Uh, program is actually a little bit more on the artistic side of things. So whether you want to get a job in animation or not, you may just want to know about animation, do your own stuff, put it up on whatever platform you choose. It gets lots and lots of really cool views and have people praise you and maybe even get some money out of it uh, if you're if things go well. Whereas um, the cutout version is a little bit more geared towards this is a technical skill. If you have that skill, you've just upped your chances of being able to get a job in that um, discipline. So it's a, it's a little bit different. Not a lot, but it is a little bit different um, as far as how we approach the, the goal. And as far as the students that we've seen who are interested in taking these classes, they tend to be, um, the hand-drawn people tend to be a little bit more artistic in scope and not quite as I don't want to say motivated because you have to be motivated to do animation at all, but not quite as motivated to just get out there into the workforce and start um, working right away. Whereas people who take the second program, they're, they're more like, no, no, just tell me what skills I need and, and I'll go get them and, and then I'll start working doing like a junior job. So just something to think about. Uh, I also will reiterate, um, I mentioned this last week, um, anybody who's interested, we have our anime instructor up and ready to go. It's going to be starting classes in February. Uh, I don't think it's been officially announced yet. I think I've only announced it here, so they haven't started advertising it yet at all. Um, I have an image from it. I don't think it's bad if I share this because it's. I think it's really cool. Let me see if I can find it real quick. I hadn't. Hadn't thought to do this tonight, but now that I think about it, it's actually something really fun that you guys might enjoy. So let me see if I can find it and share it with you. So, but the long and the short of it is, is we have uh, a person who's teaching anime style. Um, it's still just the regular program. It's the regular 2D animation program, but it is uh, taught from somebody who works in uh, Tokyo, who works on animation, who's a really wonderful artist that we were able to convince to come in and work with us. And um, as a result, uh, we are 
fortunate and excited about offering up uh, work, uh, animation mentor who actually works in the anime field and can offer tips and tricks and secrets and uh, share uh, what she knows about the animation world from sort of a little bit more of an uh, anime perspective. So just give me one second here and I will be able to pull this up. We just had this happen, so um, I announced it last week, but it's officially um, coming uh, as of February. So let me show you guys this. And I saw some really cool ads for it that the school has put together too. Um, yeah, just give me one more second here and I will get back to it. But again, I think you guys will be really excited once you see it. And be like, whoa, that's a little different than the animation that uh, that I've been working on, certainly. So there we go. There it is. And pull it out here for you guys to take a look at. And. And I'll just leave this up on the screen so you guys can check it out. Anyway, so that's um, what our artist is. Uh, that's what we're kind of using for advertising for our anime mentor who's going to be teaching the first program. Uh, the first program, uh, the hand-drawn version of the program, not the, the one I was just talking about, the cutouts, the second version of the program. Um, Lisa is going to actually be teaching um, our hand-drawn program, but from the perspective of somebody who actually works in Tokyo on animation productions uh, that are anime based and talking about you know, tips, tricks, and other specific things that you might find if you were more interested in the anime world than maybe the Disney-based world uh, and things. So anyway, um, so this is a uh, this is just like I said, this is what we're using for advertising materials, just something that the, the, the artist put together, the mentor. Um, so if you're interested in this, uh, you want to go into the website of cgspectrum.com and uh, make a request and say, hey, I'm interested in the anime 2D animation anime program, uh, 2D animation with an uh, anime emphasis, and let them know that that's something that you're interested in and then you can begin into doing that if you like. So we've got some comments. John Skull says, I like to do both styles, but mostly traditional and be artistic. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. I mean, I, I made a living doing that for many years. Um, so it's a wonderful skill to have. And uh, yeah, they're both good programs. They just have different uh, emphasis. And then, hey, Kevin, well, welcome from Kenya. Welcome back, I should say. And then DM, yeah, it does look like an Eris cat. That's that's what I was trying to do anyway. Uh, classic DM, yeah, thanks for saying hi. And then Fischio, want to study in this art school? Pretty sad. Well, I'm not quite sure why it's sad. I'm not sure I want to know, but uh, hopefully seeing some of this animation will cheer you up and uh, make you feel better about things. But anyway, this is, uh, like I said, uh, some uh, art from our new anime mentor who is teaching the hand-drawn 2D animation program with an emphasis in anime. And uh, there's other stuff too. Uh, I'll bring that up another time, but I just wanted to share that with you. All right, so back to cats. Um, now, again, this is just my rough pass. I'm just being really loose with my drawing style. I'm not spending a lot of time worrying about the artistic value of it. Uh, I'm a pretty sloppy drafts person by nature and uh, to my shame, but you know, this is a rough draft. I'll go through and I'm going to do a really nice clean line. If you've watched any of these, my sessions before, you've seen my stuff when it's finished and um, this, you know, seen that it's, it's very clean and, and uh, I was a cleanup artist for several years and as a result, uh, I you know, got really good at putting down clean lines back in the old days when covered wagons uh, were still a thing and I was working in animation. We had uh, no computers, no computer assistants, and uh, they hired us and paid us decent salaries because we could draw like computers. We could draw the equivalent of a vector line 
and, um, and it made a pretty good living at it because it wasn't that easy to do. It's much easier now to do. Uh, you can draw actual vector lines and I think it's just great. Um, sometimes jobs go away and you're real sad and you wish they wouldn't and that's that's unfortunate. But at the same time, things improve and get faster, better, and easier. It makes it easier for people like you guys to do your own animation. I'm all for it. Uh, so you can get a nice animation program on the cheap and uh, make your own stuff and do things that would have taken us hours and hours and cost scads of money for us to be able to do. And you guys can just knock it out uh, if you want to. And again, there's no excuse for you not to do that. You should be... Um, if you're interested in this stuff, you shouldn't wait for the right tools. You should just go out there and do it and just um, just keep doing what you love to do and, and love what you're doing all the while. Um, because we, you know, we didn't have that stuff when I was young and I wish I would have. It would have gotten me started a lot sooner. But, uh, anyway, tips from the veteran. So. Um, all right, so you want to challenge yourself, John Skulls? Yes, challenge yourself. That's why wouldn't you? That's what we're here to do. Uh, playing it safe and is boring, and there's only so much time in the day, and you might as well spend it doing things that you will remember later. I'm going to talk about that a little bit in just a minute. I'm still getting up and running up here. All right, one down. Um, not my best drawings in the world, but these are breakdowns. They don't have to be the best drawings in the world. I'll go back and I'll make sure that all this stuff looks really pretty when I clean it up. Um, and but you, as you can see, when I play it, it's like it's fleshing out the animation a little bit more. It's going to get smoother and smoother. Every drawing I do is going to make it look just that much more smooth than it was before. So I'm going to do one more in here. Add another one. Of course, I'm going to be sure to go up here and save. Don't forget saving. Um, all right, so classic him lost half your animation. You have to rescan 36 frames. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that's really sad. Sorry about that. Um, that's something we didn't have to deal with too much in the analog days. Uh, it did happen. There would be fires. I was working uh, on the anim animation for the Ardman uh, kind of Ardman collaboration that DreamWorks we did uh, flushed away. I think it was shortly after I was off that film. They had a fire and apparently lost a whole bunch of their animation puppets, uh, Waltz and Gromit, that sort of thing, because they had a big fire and it's just heartbreaking. But usually when you have analog copies of things, it's less prone to get lost in a big you know, just snap. Uh, so sorry about that, that really stinks. <laughs> um, but I've done it. I've rescanned things over and over and over and over and over. And that is kind of what separates the amateurs from the pros. If you have that sort of uh, obsession, uh, then you are definitely in the right direction uh, for what you want to do for a living, working in effects or I mean, animation effects, animation motion graphics, anything that takes a lot of patience. Uh, stick with it. If you've got that mindset, you'll find your place eventually, I promise you. Uh, hey, Omega, how you doing? Welcome. Um, Tron Skull is anime animation course permanent or first come first serve? Yeah, so Tron Skull, it's first come first serve. We don't have a lot of positions open. We're hoping to open it up more and more as we go. Uh, it'll also kind of see, depend on how popular it is, um, you know, how much demand we have for it. Uh, right now we're limited by the fact that our mentor is a full-time working uh, anime artist who works in the business in Tokyo full-time and as such only has limited time to uh, to be able to do this. Um, we were talking, I was chatting, chatting with her, and we were talking about the fact that uh, in order for someone who is not from Japan to be able to survive in the world of anime, um, you probably have to learn Japanese. I don't know, probably, you probably just, you have to. Um, and that's, again, if you want to work on site in Japan on anime, then you're going to have to know Japanese. And if uh, you want to break into the business, it's really tough. It's not easy to break into anime, and it's it's a rigorous schedules and not necessarily the highest pay. Uh, but you know, having said all that, it's like 
if it's something that you really love doing, nothing will stop you. And that's, I got into animation when there wasn't even an animation business. And I just stuck around and, and it all worked out. There was no point where I was even thinking of giving up and, and doing something different. It just kind of all fell into place. And I think that happens when you're on the right path. You know, or maybe it becomes the right path because it just works out. But uh, I just it never even crossed my mind to give up. It was just something I wanted to do. And through long, long overtime hours, especially when I was in CG animation, in the uh, last third of my production career, um, they would say, hey, you got to do these long hours. And people outside of the business would say to me, how do you even do that? And I couldn't physically do that. And I would never think of it that way. I just always thought, well, I mean, that was the job. That's what they hired me to do. And didn't really cross my mind that I had a choice in the matter. Uh, you can quit, but it's like, if you love the business, um, you're used to spending long hours working on projects and trying to get them just right. That's conducive to the mindset of someone who likes to do motion graphics is patience, infinite patience. So uh, yeah, so I never really questioned whether or not this job was something that I could do. I just was doing it, whether they were paying me to do it or not. And the fact that they did pay me to do it was a wonderful thing. And you can have that happen too, and then tell me all about it when it comes. Uh, what style animation is The Simpsons? So, um, it's funny you should ask because one of my dear friends, who is a, a famous animator, um, Kathy... Zelensky, she actually works on The Simpsons, and I don't honestly know. I haven't talked to her in a long time. One of my dear friends that I haven't talked to, well, I mean, I talk to her. I just don't talk shop. I don't talk about work, and I haven't seen her, obviously, in a long time. Um, I haven't seen anybody. But the last time I checked, what they were doing was they were doing the layouts here in the States and then sending those layouts on to other countries and then having them animated in other countries. And so... They're drawing, which is what my friend Kathy does best, or just CG animation as well. She can do just about anything. She sculpts and is a brilliant, brilliant artist. But what she, uh, you know, her, her bread and butter was drawing for many, many years. One of the first female animators to break into the boys' club of Disney. And uh, so, yes, as they draw layouts, they drew, they draw like character layouts of the scenes with a few drawings here and there to indicate what's supposed to happen and then send it overseas. And then somebody overseas and animates it for uh, very little money. And they also have a real backlog of stuff that they can use from their library. So they don't need to have everything animated every time. Um, so, but the look that the Simpsons has, that actually does look like the rigged style. It's very flat. It's very one-dimensional. It's a lot of arms waving and still faces with dialogue happening. Happening, And so you can imagine you've got a couple layers. I can't draw Bart. I'm not even going to try, but uh, it's a lot more difficult than you'd think. But <laughs> unless you like it and you draw it all the time. I mean, really, I haven't even seen the show I'm, since it premiered. I don't remember how he looks. If it's, if it's, <laughs> anyway, but you can imagine that um, there would be a place on his mouth um, where you could put different uh, mouth shapes. And then they have these stock mouth shapes that are themed into whatever you know, character it is and how they're supposed to look. And then they represent, you know, like a, a closed mouth, um, open mouth, sad mouth shape. And then they can just stick those in there and it'll look nice. And so it's kind of, in a funny way, it's, it's related to the rape style. Um, it's a limited animation style, which is goes all the way back to like the Flintstones, Scooby-Doo, uh, where they would use stock character templates and then just update things as needed for each individual show. And it's the only way they could do it and make the shows feasible. So, uh, um, so it's related, but not necessarily as... Uh, you know, it's as technical as rigs, where you actually have a skeleton inside of a character, and then you can manipulate the skeleton without having to redraw every single time. So, on the 21, let's start another drawing here. Blah, 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 blah. All right. 
Got another question. So is the regular course for drawing being artistic and traditional while the more advanced is being more on the technical side of things? Yes, that is correct. Drawn Skull, the first program is all about, um, we actually have drawing lessons as part of the course for people who don't, um, haven't taken fine art classes or need brushing up on their drawing skills. Whereas the second program, um, at best, you're probably designing a character for the uh, rig that you want to build. And even that is kind of a tricky proposition, and you can use rigs that we give you if you just really don't draw. You know, a lot of people in CG animation, which is very similar, where you're using a puppet, it's basically what it is, a virtual puppet, and they could animate like crazy. They just were not um, artists who, fine artists, they didn't draw things, they didn't render them out first. And that gets into the topic of, well, should you do thumbnails for CG animation, which is, you know, beyond the scope of 2D, but, you know, the question of do you have to be someone who can draw to do 2D animation? And the answer was no, you don't necessarily have to be someone who can draw to do CG animation. So with the cutouts, the rigged stuff, uh, you may not have to be quite as up on your drawing skills to do that, but you still not need to know how to do motion. You need to understand motion and be able to replicate it in your work, and that comes from observing the real world. Uh, so again, it's not, I don't think of it so much as about uh, art versus not art. I mean, it's all artistic, but I have to figure out a way to define it, and that's how I would personally define it, is there's less of I'm going to be sitting at my easel and I'm going to be thinking in terms of perspective and horizon line and how to create a volumetric shape and think of it in terms of, you know, three dimensional qualities. And then what about my gestures and, you know, all that stuff that's, that's very much uh, essential if you're going to do um, hand drawn animation like I'm doing right here on the screen. In fact, I should do more of that stuff. I'm kind of rusty, but I'm also. As I like to say, semi-retired, I don't do production anymore. I'm no longer um, working in or on uh, productions in studios and working in um, that environment. I'm a full-time teacher and uh, you're basically facilitating a lot of stuff in the animation department for the school schools um, and then teaching the stuff that I have learned over the years and sharing all my wonderful advice that I have with students who appreciate it or anybody who's interested. So, you know, well, thank you, class. <laughs> I appreciate that. Oh, it's very flattering that I like the cat. I'd say maybe next time I'll do a cat like that, it'd be easier. But again, the point isn't to do it easy. Uh, the point is, is getting into the challenges of it and the fun of it. Uh, the best animators that I know, they look for specific challenges to make the work a little more interesting, a little harder, uh, a little more uh, unique things that people have never done before. And you do it just because no one's done it before. So can you do hand-drawn animations best to know the flow of motion? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's something where uh, you kind of have to develop an eye and be able to look at the world around you and go, oh, I know how that looks. I can replicate that now in my own work. And uh, back when dinosaurs ruled the earth and I got my family got their first VCR, it's the first time I ever was able to go through and look at things in slow motion, look at them frame by frame. And uh, I've been doing it ever since. It just teaches you so much about motion and the way that things move in the real world. See, here's the thing. People always want to come up with their own animation motions that they just sort of come up with on the fly because it's they think it's easier it's more fun and the truth is is um, you're trying to reinvent the wheel you're trying to do something that's already been done before and really you're going to save yourself a lot of time if you look to reference for what you're trying to do rather than trying to do it all from scratch it sounds enticing but the truth really is that uh um, reference is your best friend and will help you get to the look that you want much faster than trying to just fuss around and try to figure out how things look. And your brain lies. You look at uh, the world around you and you, your brain kind of keeps the things that you like and it tosses the things that you don't like. 
And so when you remember an action and you try to replicate it, um, nine times out of 10, at least when you're getting started, uh, you're remembering it wrong because you're remembering only the attractive parts, the parts that you were attracted to. And that isn't how it really looked. So you really do need to go and look at a reference when you're doing a scene and think in terms of trying to capture a realistic action that you can then stylize, stylize if you want to later, but because you already know how the action is supposed to look in the real world. Um, it's not about uh, just kind of guessing how things look, and you know, specifically things like hands or broad actions or you know acrobatic actions. It's, you, know, you don't want to just spend your time guessing. I, I recommend doing it for fun, but if you're serious, I mean, if you're serious about animation, then you want to uh, you want to concentrate on trying to get as good as you can at, at replicating the world as it really is and not uh, just guessing about things because your brain lies. Right. It sounds like the regular course is right for you. Yeah, it does sound like that based on what you've said anyway. It sounds like that may be something you would be interested in. And uh, like I said, I think the pressure is a little is off. I, I don't think there's as much pressure in that one. It's it's much more about taking your time and really learning things. And uh, we, you know, we, it's three terms, so it it takes three terms before you or two terms before you finally get to your, your final project. And at which point, uh, then you design everything in your own scene and create your own scene from scratch with the help of your friendly neighborhood mentor. Um, which I'm uh, not mentoring as much these days because I'm the kind of I'm the head of the department, so it's I don't have the time uh, to mentor as much. But everybody we hire is is a person who works in the business, and in some ways it's um, it's even more exciting because like we've got people who've directed animation and all, they can tell you stories about. And what it's like to direct. We have people in all walks of life, but they work in production, they work on modern productions, and uh, have all sorts of exciting takes on the business uh, that are different. So everybody's kind of got a different take on things, um, which I think is a great thing. I think it's, good, it's a good, healthy way to approach anything is to see that there are different perspectives and there's not just one way of looking at stuff. So uh, anyway, yeah, but it's a little bit slower pace, a little more languid, three terms of solid animation, learning and experience, leading to a final project uh, that, uh, that you can then take with you. I mean, everything that we do in the class, you can take with you. Some of the, <clears throat> some of the assignments are a little bit more conducive to uh, getting you know, together a reel, and then some of them are more about just exploring um, but by the end of it you definitely have uh, you know if you've done all the work of course then you have enough you should have enough material to be able to put a reel together and uh, sell yourself as an animator and then the rest is kind of up to you uh, it's not there are no promises for anyone when it comes time to getting a job getting a job isn't really that easy I, I, I wish I'd, it was um, but then again it was easy everybody to do it um, so getting a job in the animation business uh, it isn't the easiest thing in the world but it's also not impossible and so uh, if it's something that you're really strongly interested in then nothing should stop you I always tell the story that when I was uh, getting into the business um, everybody told me there wasn't a business at all there was no there were no jobs in animation, and at first I listened to them, and I was really sorry about that uh, because um, I ended up working without a break for many, many years. And if uh, and I had listened to them, and I, I would have gotten start, started sooner if I just ignored people telling me that, well, it's really hard to get into the business. It's really uh, not a guaranteed thing, and I didn't have any inroads whatsoever other than a real supportive family. Um, I'd worked at Disneyland uh, briefly for the summers. I just came down to LA and worked at Disneyland. Um, so, I mean, 
it, but I didn't have any more chances than anybody else. And, and the way that I got into the business was really coincidence after coincidence. But mostly it comes down to I was really determined uh, to do animation for a living if I could and tried everything uh, I could. So, so let's see. the journey to learn animation and work at a place like Pixar Disney looks so long. <laughs> well, Kevin, I mean, having said that, so you said that it looks like it's a long journey. Having said that, when I ended up there, it wasn't long at all. I mean, I think about it. I got out of college in the fall, uh, or actually, no, I got out of college in the spring, spent the summer with my parents, um, friend of a friend said give me a job in an unrelated field in Hollywood and I thought well I just need to get to Hollywood because that's how you did things back then and through a connection at the studio I worked which is an editing house um, I was led to a studio that was creating animation um, and eventually got a job there as a driver and then worked my way up and slowly but surely became a respected member of the animation world of the 90s and so it really happened very fast if you think about it that's not and then I know lots of people who've gone to classes and developed the material and then get a job right after they get out and it didn't take them any time at all so and then what is time you know it's what are you going to do with your life are you going to uh, not animate um, if you let something like not getting a job stop you from animating then it's likely that you didn't really want to animate that much in the first place. Um, because all the animators I know, successful or otherwise, um, they were well, concentrating on the successful ones. They, uh, they animated regardless of whether they were doing it for a living or not. They just loved it so much, they just did it. And so that nine times out of 10 will end up separating the people who work in the business from the people who don't is uh, you love it so much you do it regardless and then the adventure doesn't seem quite so long all of a sudden because you were already doing what you love to do whether it's on the side while you're working at a job you're not that passionate about uh, or you're doing it for a living either way you win because you're doing what you love to do and think about anybody you've ever met who didn't really know what to do with themselves uh, don't know what to do with their time or what to do for a career if you have an obsession like I want to get into animation, even if you don't get there, just think of all the time you spent uh, trying to get what you wanted and how exciting it is. Um, and, and nine times out of 10, you will get it. It just won't look like you thought it was. But that doesn't matter because you get all that anticipation and all the excitement of working towards your dream. Think about this, if, if you got your dream tomorrow, number one, you probably wouldn't appreciate it. Number two, then what would you do? And, and I actually did run into that at a point in my career where I got, I achieved all the things I wanted to do. Sometime around the time I worked at DreamWorks, maybe even earlier, maybe when I worked at Disney, um, it, I looked around and I realized, I mean, it was a well-paid, respected member of the, then the greatest Disney studio in the world, amongst the best artists that animation had to offer at that time. Where do you go from there? I mean, you could continue on and get better and better and rise higher and higher in the company. And a lot of people did that. And I did go a little bit higher in the company at DreamWorks than I did at Disney. But but it was just you know baby steps. I'd gotten what I wanted. And uh, there wasn't a whole lot more that I needed to do or wanted to do. And it was interesting. I'll just say that. It was a tricky thing to find yourself. What happens if you get everything you, you ever wanted? you find yourself kind of going, well, now what? And uh, fortunately, I found all sorts of other things that I wanted to do in the wake of that. But uh, but that's why I, I offer this up and say, enjoy the time when you're thinking about the long journey. Enjoy the journey. That's, uh, that's going to matter a lot more than the, the destination in the end. Uh, which brings me to, um, well, first of all, John Skull is a big picture of puppet in traditional animation is, but uh, Rick and Morty, yeah, Rick and Morty, um, that qualifies as the puppet stuff. So yeah, that's what it looks like. Um, but what, so this brings me to, I'm kind of talking the historical here. Um, we had a loss in the animation industry this week. Um, Dale Bear uh, passed away. And uh, Dale was uh, one of what they call the nine young 
men. Um, there was the original nine old men were all these guys who came up with Disney animation and the 12 principles and, and such not. And then after them, they needed to train new animators to take their place. And so out of that came the nine young men, which were uh, people in the 60s and 70s who were going to take over after Walt Disney died and, and keep the torch burning because animation is something that you have to pass along like a torch. Uh, it's not something you get by reading a book or uh, looking at tutorials online. It's you got to have a mentor. You have to have uh, someone to guide you through the processes and tell you things that they just, there's just no way to explain them in uh, any other way than through mentorship. So Dale Bear was, was mentored by the original nine old men uh, of some of them. And then he forged his own path in the seventies, worked on some really cool stuff, worked at Disney, uh, got a start working on Disney projects in the seventies, and then opened up his own company uh, in the wake of Roger Rabbit because uh, he had worked on the Roger Rabbit, the Toontown sequence of Roger Rabbit, and um, and decided to open up his own studio and, and do this look of Roger Rabbit for commercials. So commercials that would have, that were like Rice Krispies and um, Tony the Tiger and others, and they, they would have like a shadow and a highlight, and they looked like they fit into the live action environment. And that was kind of the specialty of Dale's studio. And he could do anything, but he uh, you know, opened that studio to kind of capitalize on that and basically be an outsourced studio for Disney. And that's where I caught up with him um, when I was uh, just getting started out in the business. I started at Bear as their driver and slowly but surely worked my way up into an artistic position and, uh, and then eventually moved on. Um, but... Uh, I have so many stories about Dale. I, everybody knew him did. He was the sweetest, kindest uh, animation person I've ever met. He, from day one, treated me as if I was somebody worthy of the respect, you know, like a real animator. I don't know if he just saw it in my passion. Maybe he saw a little of himself. Or maybe he uh, was just nice to everybody. I kind of think the latter. I don't think there was anything particularly special about me. Uh, in that sense, there were people who were a lot more dedicated to the craft than I was um, and who are just amazing animators uh, out there right now who could tell you a lot of stories about Mr. Bear. But for my part, um, you know, I was this young punk kid. I wasn't a punk. I was a sweet kid, <laughs> I think. And um, got into the studio environment and was really hungry and looking for uh, ways to get more involved and become an actual animator and and Dale was just right there giving me suggestions and he said you can stop by my office anytime and, and show me stuff and I'll I'll give you uh, suggestions and help you out if I can and you know he obviously didn't have to do that nowadays I would no more go into his office and ask for help than I would uh, um, you know try to contact you know some celebrity or something it's just, it's like they had no business, but he was so approachable and so uh, easygoing that um, you could, you felt just comfortable patting down the hall to his office and going, hey, can you help me with something? And, uh, and then he would, and he would help you. He would tell you what he thought and give you encouragement. And the last thing I think um, in, in terms of that uh, that I dealt with him was we were going to do these Mickey Mouse shorts, which eventually became Runaway Brain um, that Disney did in house. And uh, I kind of said to him, I said, well, if I can prove that I'm capable, will you give me a shot at being an animator on that show as opposed to a cleanup person, which is what I was. And I was rather well respected for that. And he's like, sure, yeah, you know, I mean, you're going to have to prove it. But uh, yeah, if you can prove that you can animate, uh, we will very definitely give you a shot. And more or less implied that that, that was going to happen, that he had seen my work and he knew what I was capable of. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure I could have gotten at least some secondary stuff, some, some less important shots on one of those projects. And that would have sent me off on a slightly different path than I ended up on but he just really really was there for everybody and uh, and for me personally you know, he just 
it's just like having, I mean, kind of looked like Santa Claus, but it was like having Santa Claus right there. And you'd laugh and just go, yep, 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 everything's going to be just fine. And then you'd believe it. And uh, so uh, it's real sad that we lost him this week. I actually had not spoken to him for a really long time. We lost touch uh, for a variety of reasons over the years. But, um, but while it lasted and for some time after, it was just like having kind of an angel in your corner. He was um, one of the reasons I was able to make my second short was because he arranged so that I could have material donated to me. It was very expensive to make animated films back then. And I was just trying to make a, a cheap limited animation cartoon, but I wanted to do it all myself. And it was really difficult because it was just so expensive and through Dale Bear and his company, I was able to get all the materials I needed donated. I bought some things. I think I paid for some paper and, you know, a couple things here and there, but for the most part, um, everything was donated by Dale's company. And uh, it's funny, I was just talking about this a week or so ago before he uh, found out that he passed away, which is I don't know that he was thrilled with the outcome <laughs> with the film that I made. Um, if when he saw it, I, I don't, it wasn't really the type of thing that he did and it was pretty bitter and cynical. Um, and it was very much the type of thing that, that I was all about at that time. A friend and I wrote it together and, uh, you know, it was definitely not something that exemplified the art of animation. It was more like I was using animation in a very limited style to try and tell the story that I wanted to tell. And so I don't know, I mean, he was very quiet. And, closed off about a lot of things and then real open about other things um so i don't know if he, he i don't know if he liked it or not um i hope he didn't feel that his uh, generosity in handing me the materials and things was a mistake <laughs> i don't think it was um i just i just think he probably just looked at it and went huh okay well that happened not something he would have done but um, i think he respected me for at least trying and everybody back then they you know, really supported my uh, ambitions and, and believed in my uh, dreams that I was always harping on and on about. But the difference was is that I actually enacted these dreams. I actually tried to do these things that I always said I was going to do. Uh, whereas a lot of people will just talk uh, about all the things they want to do and never quite get around to uh, doing things because they know, rightly so, that the, the odds are you're going to make a lot of mistakes when you're trying to, to achieve something when you're just getting started and it can be really daunting or seem like it's going to take forever. So, um, yeah, so and maybe that was part of the reason that he liked me, but I, I think it's just, he liked everybody and he loved people who were excited about animation like he was. And so he would tell us me personally, but a lot of us, he would tell us, you know, the things he worked on, what it was like to work with all these famous animation character people. Um, he told me some great stories about uh, lesser known films that didn't have the, they didn't have the uh, standing that the Disney films had, you know, like things like the Lord of the Rings movie with Bakshi or the Wizards with Bakshi. I mean, he told me again, I don't know if any of this is true. Maybe I dreamed it, but I remember him distinctly telling me that he went to work for Bakshi on Black Lord of the Rings, the cartoon from the seventies because he'd seen Wizards. Uh, Bakshi's first fantasy film and uh, was so crazy about it. It was so different that he couldn't imagine you know, how fun it would be to work on something like that. And so he, that's how he ended up working on Wizards. I mean, uh, Lord of the Rings. And uh, he would joke with me. He said that that uh, Frodo in Lord of the Rings actually has his hairstyle, Dale's hairstyle, which at the time was, his, they called it a 70s shag. And it's split down the middle. I used to wear it um, Ironically, for years I would have it, but split down the middle and then kind of feathered out. It's like an old style of hair. Anyway, so um, you know, stories like that you can't, you can couldn't buy those kinds of stories. They're just stories he'd tell in the moment about the people he worked with and, and the projects he worked on. And he was just so sort of nondescript about it. And so, like, oh yeah, 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 no, I, I did that. We did that. And he'd giggle like really coy. Uh, when he'd talk about things or he got kind of embarrassed if you flattered him or something. 
and uh, you know, just just a great person all around. So again, it's real uh, unfortunate that we lost him. I again lost track of him. I don't know what he was doing in the last years. I'm pretty sure he was at Disney. That's the last I heard. That's the last time I saw him. Probably, I don't know, seven or eight years ago. Um, so I mean, obviously he wasn't a close personal friend, but there for a while. Uh, he babysat my cat <laughs> one time. I was going on vacation and he knew that I was going to be gone and he said, hey, you want me to watch your, my, your cat for you? And my cat was insane. It was a crazy animal. Just really, I mean, cats are crazy. That's why we like them. But uh, this one was particularly insane. And he said, uh, no, I don't mind. I'll take care of your cat for you while you're on vacation. And so he did. I came back from vacation and I said, just kind of nervous. Uh, the boss, an animation legend, and the boss of the studio that I worked for, paying my bills, you know, watch staying in my apartment and watching my cat. They're not staying there, but you know, visiting. And uh, I said, "So how to go?" And he goes, "Oh, it's great." And we just sat and we watched Hook. We watched the movie Hook. He was a big fan of it, and I wasn't. He goes, "Oh, you got to see it. You'll really love it. You got to see Hook with Robin Williams and Dustin Hoffman." I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I need to see that or not. He goes, no, 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 try it. You'll really like it. I said, okay. Yeah, and it was fun. But I can just see him sitting there in my apartment watching Hook with my cat sitting next to him, my nutso cat um, from back then. And he said, oh, your cat was great. I didn't think he was crazy at all. It's actually a lot of fun. We just hung out. So <laughs> that's the image that I'm going to be, uh, that I'll remember Dale for, or among many, but um, him just sitting on my couch watching hook in the 90s with um, with my uh, crazy cat. Uh, he's also the one that, uh, Dale's also the one that, oh, hold on, I got something drawn screen. You like the animation style of Harley Quinn. It's amazing. You should, yeah, no, that's a great one. Uh, that's really nice. And uh, that style is so exciting and dynamic. So, yeah, try copying it. Try see if you can copy that style. That, that's a good one to kind of learn. Um, but Dale was the one who always told me, well, he told me once, he didn't need to tell me twice, but he told me that um, don't worry so much about the credits that you're going to get or the kudos or the attention that you'll get for working on specific projects. Think about the time that you spent on the project and the people that you worked with. That's what you're going to remember someday. And the, the rest will all kind of just fall by the wayside. He said one day, and it was so weird because I was really at a down place and, and I, I wasn't going to get a credit on the film that I worked on and it's really down about it and he goes listen one day you will find that you you're gonna have so many credits you won't even remember half of them or maybe you, you won't remember some of them and he was just like you're gonna work on lots and lots of movies you're talented and you're going to have a lot of films uh, to your credit teacher uh, on your resume or whatever and he's like so don't worry about this one this it's it's not what it's all about getting those credits it's um you know the time that you spent on these films and projects and the people that you worked with and whether or not you were you know loving what you did and did what you love and so of course that's exactly what happened and he knew it i, I don't know how he knew it i don't or, or again maybe it was just lip service he says that said that to everybody but he was convinced he's like nope you're gonna do things you're gonna go out there and you're going to work on a lot of movies and have tons of credits and just have a great career. And by gum, that's exactly what happened. So uh, he was absolutely right about that. And and I did trust him. I mean, I, I didn't believe it at the time. I was like, well, yeah, sure, because I'm not getting a credit on this one film that my whole world's come to an end. I was young. Um, but a part of me, I thought, well, but yeah, maybe he's right. Maybe one day I will be able to say that I worked on a lot of incredible movies and uh, that is that is what happened so um, I really got to hand it to him uh, for just sort of endowing me and all the other people who ever were trained by him endowing us with that um, kind of dignity that, that that animation is something that is worth struggling for and that if you stick with it and if you you know stay disciplined and stay on target um, that the rewards will be well worth the work. So, and again, to anybody who wants to do this stuff, it's like to not be afraid of the work and to, to realize that the work is actually the fun 
that you're not racing, racing, racing to get something done so you can move on to something bigger and you're not trying to get a fame and fortune out of it, uh, which those things are kind of traps anyway. They're not what they seem. Um, but you're actually just wanting to love what you do. And by the end of that, if you actually are lucky enough to have found your way into something that you love to do, then you get to spend your life doing what you love to do. I mean, even whether you're working or not, uh, you're, you're still um, on the right path. Uh, so anyway, so I can kind of thank Dale for having uh, shared that stuff with me at, a, at an early age and teaching me that stuff because uh, whether he knew it in advance or not, um, I definitely ended up using his advice and being really glad that I did listen, that I had somebody who was a mentor that uh, would, would tell me stuff like that and stuff that I can really use. And that's one of the reasons I became a teacher is so I can pass on the things that I know and, and share those things with other people. Um, one thing that I think I've said this before, in case anybody's heard my, all my stories already, but um, one of my favorite stories about working at Bear Animation uh, that's not really about Dale, but um, my first task, the first day I was hired on the job, my task was that I was going to have to clean up one of the, uh, the, the clean up the attic, basically. It was this nice, clean, white painted attic that they had, and they had all this stuff stored, stored up there. And it was boxes and boxes and boxes of animation art from classic films. So they had boxes of stuff from Toontown, uh, the sequence that they had uh, created uh, in-house at Bear Animation. They had lots and lots of artwork from that. And then they had lots of artwork from Sleeping Beauty, original artwork, backgrounds, painted cells, uh, cell setups with multiple characters, and all just, just stacks of it, all just sitting in boxes in this attic that had been kind of forgotten um, by someone. And, you know, I, I sat and I looked at that stuff and I thought, wow, I mean, here I am, I'm tasked with cleaning up this um, attic. Nine times out of ten, most people don't even know this stuff's here. And it was at a time when animation cells were actually becoming a commodity. They were selling them at Sotheby's and things. And then they were going for high prices. I mean, I consider a single piece of art that's an animation cell from an old film that's between fifteen hundred and three thousand dollars and up. You know, that, that's a that's a pretty good uh, markup for that stuff. You know, at the time that was already happening, but it, it got even bigger after. And uh, I confess, I was tempted. I was tempted to go in there and just think, well, you know, I'm not going to miss one of these, and not to sell, but just to have. And uh, yeah, I've told this story before, but um, but uh, in the end, I just thought, yeah, but I mean, I've got all this artwork right in front of me right now. What am I going to do? Take it home, put it on my wall, and stare at it? Or can I just relish the fact that I'm in the animation industry and I'm able to be around all this stuff that was really an intrinsic part of my youth and that things like you know, Sleeping Beauty, uh, those things were things that got me into wanting to be in the animation industry in the first place. And now here they are. They're sitting right in front of me and I'm working for a studio with people who worked on some of this stuff and, I, and I'm in. And part of being in was is I don't need to own any of this. I don't need to take it with me. Um, you don't really own stuff anyway, in the end, getting philosophical. Um, but I was able to own it in the sense that it's it's right there in front of me every single day. I could go and take a look at it if I wanted to. And that was really enough. That's all I needed was to be able to just go, wow, that's, um, that's there and it's part of history. I know somebody, the person who came along after me, um, I believe, as he said, uh, I believe he did did succumb to temptation and he ended up making off with some animation art and he actually was quite successful in his career and, and a good guy and I liked him. We were friends for a long time. And I don't know how that story ends. I won't speculate. Um, but he was a very successful person and more power to him if he felt that it was worth it to take something that wasn't his and, and 
you know, it meant that much to him that he'd risk getting caught uh, for stealing from the company. I, you know, that's, that's, it's not for me to say whether that was a good or bad thing. It's just not, when I was faced with the, t with the temptation to do it, all I could think was, is, well, why do I need to steal this? Why do I need to take it and try to make it mine? It isn't mine um, in any sense of the word. Even if I kept it, it wouldn't be mine. It's just a thing that's out there that represents something I loved when I was a kid and was inspirational to get me into the business. Um, I've kept a lot of my own drawings. I don't know that they encouraged that when we were working in animation you know, on films for DreamWorks and Disney. Um, we were drawing on paper and I ended up keeping a lot of drawings that didn't make it, you know, or copies. I'd do a drawing and do it again for whatever reason, like the paper would get worn down or something. And I kept a lot of that stuff and I made a lot of Xeroxes of stuff that I worked on. But it was for my own business. It was not um, to sell. It wasn't to uh, uh, make my, you know, it wasn't to show off or frame or anything. It was just I wanted a little piece of something that I worked on and it didn't hurt anybody or do anything. So, anyway, have you heard of the upcoming animated show Invincible? The trailer looks amazing. I'll have to check that out. That actually sounds really cool. Um, wondering if it's, is it related to something? Is it related to, uh, uh, an IP that already exists? Is there a graphic novel or movie or something that it's tied to? It seems like that happens a lot. I, and again, I don't think that's a bad thing. It's proven material, so why not? But uh, yeah, no, I haven't heard of it. It's cool. All right, so finishing up the eyes on this thing. So, um, but yeah, so here's a toast to, to Dale Bear, who was essential and intrinsic in helping so many people get their start. I mean, it's, again, these are just some of, some of my many, many stories. Um, I have friends who could tell you really deep cut stories about uh, animation stuff uh, that Dale liked to talk about. Um, I'm not talking too much about that, number one, because I'm not sure everybody would know, number two. There's some stories that's just like, no, that was just to be shared between us. It's not stuff that I'm going to run around and claim as my own story. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just talking about stories that I had personal direct contact with Dale that were kind of cute and fun. Um, but uh, there are plenty of stories of the amazing things that he did and the amazing people that he mentored and uh, rich histories of uh, animation that, that people have been a part of throughout the years. Um, my stories are, you know, like I remember uh, him taking us to Taco Armies and telling us about the rabbit that they had as a pet. Or uh, we had to do something. I think we were moving a bunch of junk from the attic into a storage facility. And he drove us and he was playing country music full blast. And he, he liked to wear cowboy boots. And, and I was like, oh, I did not know that about him. That's cool. And it was really funny. Uh, I wasn't even aware of country music when I was younger. So um, anyway. Uh, yeah, so some of my stories about Dale, number one, um, you know, I, I'm i not out to try and uh, make it sound like, oh, that's this horrible tragedy of his loss and everything. It's like, yeah, that's a given. It's understood whenever anybody passes away too soon and uh, like he did, it's, it's a thing. But uh, I'm kind of here more to celebrate his life and the memories that I have of him that are really good. Those are the things that I pass on and the things that he taught me and the things that he said. Um, that's uh, more what I'm all about as far as um, his passing. So anyway, those are some of my Dale Bear stories. Um, Todd McFarland's company, huge fan. Yeah, it's it's funny. I mean, I, I remember McFarland toys. I don't know, maybe you remember that John Skull. I had a friend who collected them and uh, um, they were so interesting and so cool and obviously you know, kind of violent and, and dark. Um, but I don't hear so much about those anymore. And so I was wondering if those toys are still a thing, if they still make the McFarland toys, if they're still popular, um, if anybody actually still collects them or you know, if they can be collected. The thing is, is, I mean, Toys R Us is gone. 
and that was a place where uh, my friend was getting most of them. And he'd go and he'd look at them, and the latest ones that were out, and decide which ones he wanted, and eventually got them all. And, uh, and then he eventually got rid of them all when he moved on to other obsessions. But I've, I've always been curious. I just haven't looked into it to see if McFarland's still out there in the in the figurine game. But uh, yeah, I always thought it was a really cool tool too. Is there anything in particular that Todd McFarlane did that you thought was um, more noteworthy? That this like what is your favorite thing in Todd McFarlane's uh, collection? I guess that's the best way I could put it. I'm curious to know what he's known for today. Like I said, mainly when I was, I'm talking way back in the 90s, uh, he was known for those uh, collectibles, collectible figures that were really gruesome and kind of like Hellraiser. So yeah, I'm curious to know what uh, what he's known for now, and uh, how you maybe I like how you came across him too. It's always curious about stuff like that. How did you find him in the first place? So. Just looking for some help here. I actually roughed out this scene earlier and didn't do a very nice job of it. So now I've gone back and I've uh, started filling in the blanks. But uh, this is a really tough breakdown pose. So I'm going to be using all sorts of fun tools here in a minute to try and make this look like a really good in-between. I've been trying to save all the really easy ones so that... Uh, continue to talk and draw at the same time but eventually you have to find a drawing that's a little tougher than the others and you actually have to do some serious drawing and that's what I'm working on right now so he's still big in the toy business McFarlane you follow him on Instagram cool to check it out he made a new spawn toy there's a word I haven't heard in a while uh, there's so he's keeping spawn going well that's cool that's awesome I remember it seemed like Spawn kind of went away a little bit when they made the CG animated film and it didn't do what they expected it to do or something. I don't know. Um, if I remember right, I, I didn't have a problem with it. But uh, it's good to know that he keeps moving on and keeps creating stuff. It was always so creative. As gruesome as it was, it was also really uh, thought-provoking, really creative. I, I'm not afraid of stuff that's violent or gruesome. Please don't share anything in this uh, live stream that's in any way gruesome or disturbing. That's uh, have to be removed. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I don't shy away from that stuff. I was obsessed with horror films when I was a kid. I've worked on some horror films. And um, I think, you know, as long as, particularly as long as it's fantasy related, if it's got some fantasy element to it, a non-reality thing to it. I'm, I'm all, all about it. So I always liked the stuff that he did. When I was a kid, we had Ravel models, and some of those could get pretty nasty, and they scared me to death. The ones that I had, I had them all sitting on my shelf, and they were glow-in-the-dark toys that you built, models. And uh, my mom would say, well, why would you put up these things that actually scare you? I'm like, well, because they're really cool, and because they glow in the dark, and because I'm a kid, that's why. And that was enough. So I don't know. The, I mean, the, the McFarlane stuff was a lot more edgy than anything than I ever had as a kid. But, uh, but yeah, I thought it was real, real creative and fun, and and uh, you know, a lot of uh, creativity and thought and, and art, artistry went into the making of those things. They're really cool. So, nice. It's nice to hear some of that stuff is still around. I kind of cheated with this paw. I kind of did a lot of tracing and copying and pasting with it. I know that's going to come back and get me eventually. Uh, I'm going to have to go in and actually do some drawings, but at least here I'm able to um, make some determinations, you know, about where the paw should be at any given moment in this scene, and then I can always go back and be a little more creative with the uh, the animation. But first, I just want to 
lay it in and make sure that it's locked out nicely and that the timing of it is working okay. So that's why there's a lot of cut and paste for the for the paw. And he's working on reimagining adult spawn in PG-13 version. Oh, that's cool. Working with Blumhouse, that's smart. And make a new film. Oh, that's cool. Very nice. Well, it's good to know. As I said, it's keeping the torch burning. That's great. All right. So now I'm going to do something that I don't do that often. Um, whenever I do, it's a big ordeal because usually it uh, means I'm going to have to start the program over again, shut it down, open it up again. But I'm going to draw using the uh, trace in place um, for Toon Boom. And what it basically means is I'm going to grab three of the drawings that I'm using right now, the uh, drawing before, the drawing after, and then the one that I'm working on, and uh, send them into trace and place mode. So I send them to the desk, and then make sure I'm in my drawing window, and turn on the tools that I need. And what I get by doing that is, is I get drawings that are on pegs. See these, see the circle? Oh, already did it. I already showed you what I'm going to do in advance, but uh, see the circle and the two squares. So that's uh, pegs. It's just like when we used to draw um, using paper and we would put these things on pegs that would be raised and put the paper on that. The paper would be punched in advance, depending on where you got it from. Uh, and then you could occasionally take your drawings off of the pegs and use your drawings to compare to uh, the drawing before and the drawing after it and make sure that you've got volumes and things correct. And uh, that's one of the unique things about Toon Boom that I really, really love and uh, makes uh, life much easier when you're trying to do hand-drawn animation. And in fact, uh, I wouldn't be able to draw a clean in between with the scene if I didn't actually have the ability to trace in place, it just is almost impossible. I say almost because people have been doing it for years uh, without, but um, uh, before uh, light tables came along, they would try it. But anyway, so I'm just going to start tracing and placing this so that I can actually draw my character using shapes that have already been set up. And I'm just going to get rid of the one that I'm currently working on, just to get it out of there, so that I can effectively draw. Wow, that's a pretty sad in between. Well, I'll fix it up later. Um, so yeah, so I can effectively draw uh, the in between between this one and the one previous to it. So I'm going to move the cat's face into position and rotate it around a little bit. Actually change that rotation point. Nah, whatever, I'm not gonna worry about that right now. And put it in place like so. And then put the middle drawing in between, put that one in there, and then I can go in and actually draw the face on top of that and make sure that it looks really nice. A drawing on this side, and add another drawing on this side, and then place my character's face somewhere in between. So it lines up nice and neat, and uh, then I'll start drawing it. All right, so do the fireside chats still happen? That's a good question because I never was involved in the fireside chats. Uh, so I don't know if they were, uh, if that's still a goal or not. Um, it's a good opportunity for me to mention that there are other streams available for CG Spectrum. If you have other interests besides just what I'm doing tonight, which is 2D animation, if you'd like to know more about CG animation, which is another thing that I do, but somebody else does the uh, stream for that one, um, just go ahead and check the schedule that's at the end of this, uh, or wherever you're watching this from, there should also schedule or you can go to cgspectrum.com and learn about that too 
and that's a way of uh, you know learning about things. I know that we're talking more and more about Unreal Engine for those of you who are in the digital digital world. Uh, maybe you're interested in learning more about that. Um, and uh, so be sure and check out the other streams and the other mentors, all of whom are experts in their field and are delighted to talk to anybody about anything. Um, if you want to learn about other things besides the topic for tonight, which is just 2D animation in general. But uh, as you can see, I'm happy to talk about animation in all its guises. Uh, somebody was wanting to talk earlier today in a class about uh, you know, animating rocks, you know, just moving rocks around and taking a snapshot every frame and, and make, giving them the illusion that they're moving. Yeah, it's animation, it's all good, motion graphics. Uh, experimental stuff leads to projects that are eventually done professionally. Will Vinton started out doing the animation uh, with clay and ended up animating the uh, California Raisins. It's an old reference, it's long forgotten by now, but um, he did, and then that led him to a feature animation gig doing animation for a film called Journey Back to Oz in 1985. Well, when you're from Oregon, as I'm, uh, the idea that he was going to be working on a feature animated film with a huge budget and Disney backed that film, Journey Back to Oz, um, and had asked him to do you know, some animation, or I don't know how it came to pass, but you know, they got a deal to do animation. The clay animation in a big budget feature animation film, boy, that was big news at the time uh, in Oregon where I lived, and uh, really exciting development. And I briefly considered working there on a couple occasions actually, um, back in the olden days when I lived there, and then 2013 or so when I actually was out of a job, and somebody and you worked there and said, hey, they do dig digital stuff up here as well as clay stuff or puppet animation, physical. And I uh, had to really d debate whether or not I wanted to go back and live in Oregon again, since it's where I was born and raised and left to come and work in Hollywood. And at that time, it didn't work out. I've always trusted the universe. The universe kind of pushes different things at different times for whatever reason, whether it's just your inner voice or whatever. Um, and it clearly wasn't going to happen, and I just kind of forgot about it and let it go. And then there were a bunch of layoffs, <laughs> and so I'm kind of glad that didn't work out after all. Uh, but it would have been fun. I always, And it wasn't uh, Will Vinton anymore. Sorry, I left that part out. Now it is called Leica. So Leica did uh, the Kubo and the strings, whatever. Um, box Trolls and... Um, the one that I suddenly all of a sudden I can't think of. I always do this in live streams. It's like, I don't know what the heck was the name of that movie again? Uh, the little girl who goes and people have buttons for eyes. And, and oh, I don't know. It's, it's right on the tip of my tongue. Everybody's seen that film. You guys know what I'm talking about. Um, but anyway, stop motion animation. Uh, you know, it's, it's as legitimate as anything else. Now, all I can think of is what in the heck is the name of that movie? And it's really cool. I saw it uh, in 3D before it was actually released in a theater and wasn't a big fan of it at first because I thought it was kind of grating. And then I watched it again and I thought, this is just the most amazing thing. Coraline, thank you, Vanessa. See, this is actually a test. This is, I want to see if anybody out there is listening and uh, anybody's actually interested. Um, so occasionally I just quiz you and make sure that... Uh, no, no, actually, I'm just joking about that. Thank you for filling that in. Uh, yeah, so I got invited to see Coraline before it was done, um, but it was mostly done. It was in 3D and it was knocked out by the, oh, <laughs> so we'll walk up. Yeah, I'm not knocking Oregon, that's for sure. Uh, well, obviously, it's my homeland and um, I've thought occasionally about going back and uh, living there again, but uh, probably won't happen at this point, but who knows, never say never. It's beautiful and I go whenever I get a chance. Um, anyway, so yeah, Oregon uh, is where Leica was based, which there is based, which was formerly the Will Vinton studio, late of the California Raisins, and uh, was it the Noid from Domino's Pizza, I think, something like that. And then Will Vinton was a, an award-winning animator in his own right before all that, who did a lot of shorts that I found very influential. 
and got me wanting to try clear animation on my own. That and Christmas specials. That's I don't know if anybody's seen those. Uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and stuff from the 60s. Uh, I saw them in the 70s and they really inspired me, made me want to explore how that was done and see if I could do it. And, and I bring that stuff up for y'all as a way of saying, you know, try stuff. Uh, if you can imagine it, uh, you can find a way to, to make it happen. Um, but you have to try things and you have to experiment and you can't wait for others to give you permission or to give you the tools that you need uh, or I mean you can always ask people for assistance and ask them how they did things and people love to be asked questions and flattered I mean look at me it's like yeah ask me stuff um, but I mean I'm doing this because this is what I do for a living basically but uh, not this specifically, but uh, animation is uh, teaching animation is what I do. Um, but you know, explore stuff, try things, make experiments, and uh, and see whether or not you like motion graphics in, in any particular form. I have a friend who left DreamWorks as a CG animator, left to go up to like actually no, went to Ardman to work on their next stop motion animated film, whatever it was. And I was just like, I couldn't imagine doing that. It's not uh, my specialty by any stretch. But he was really excited and he stayed there for a really long time and had a great time with it. Um, so Vanessa, the Coraline gave you nightmares. Gee, I can't imagine why. <laughs> it kind of gave me nightmares too, uh, but uh, delightful nightmares, it turns out. Uh, I think the reason I didn't care for that film at first is because I just didn't understand the storytelling. Um, I teach a story class, or I'm at least teaching one right now, and uh, you know, study story. And I've made my own work. I've done my own shows and my own films, and uh, written a bunch of books. Writing, still writing books today, and um, I never quite understood you know, the storytelling of a thing like Coraline, which is based in. Uh, Neil Gaiman and that lot. And uh, so I think when I first saw it, I, it was just new, it was unexpected. And so I didn't really grab it. And plus I'm not 14, you know, I think that there is a, it helps to be a kid for some stuff. But when I first encountered Alice in, Alice in Wonderland upon which Coraline uh, bases some things, you know, I was very young and I didn't need what I need today, which is but well, why is this happening? Why do they have buttons for eyes? And what's the point of all this? And where's it leading? And why do I care? You know, that's stuff that adults do. And kids, I, don't, I think, are a lot more forgiving. So when I went back and looked at it again, knowing that it didn't have the kind of storytelling I was expecting, it's a lot easier for me to just sit back and relax and enjoy the visual aspects of it and just let it kind of wash over a, a viewer and, and I really appreciated it much more on that level. And uh, I just love it. I think it's just wonderful. It's the same way I feel about David Lynch films is you know, you go into a David Lynch film thinking you're gonna have things explained to you and you're gonna be real frustrated thinking it's going to make sense eventually. Whereas if you go in and you're just gonna expect it to be sort of like experiencing a painting or, or something like that, that, you may find it to be a lot less frustrating. Anyway, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, um, I, I don't really know what they're actually doing it like at this point either. I know people got laid off from there at a certain point. Anyway, Rudolph the Red Nose Reindeer. You know, that's the one you thought was horrifying. Yeah, no, fair enough. Yeah, Coraline, it's, it's beautiful, but it is scary. I mean, if you're a little kid and the spiders, and especially in 3D, it was coming at you and you felt like it was in your face. Um, I can see a kid being scared of that. There's a lot of horror in elementary. Nothing scares me more than those movies. <laughs> yeah. well, I remember being a kid and, and the Bumble, Bumble Slow Man, comes out uh, for the first time in the uh, Rudolph cartoon. And uh, that probably traumatized a whole bunch of us. But it wasn't, wasn't just me. It's a whole bunch of us that were traumatized by that experience of watching that film. Um, as kids and the way it was presented, it's funny too because the way that the abominable is presented in Rudolph uh, it's the fact that you can't see what it is and then when you get a little glimpse of it it looks kind of maniacal uh, this big cross-eyed fanged thing 
and then later you realize it's just this plush toy. <laughs> and uh, I think that's important for kids to go through that experience. Um, there's a shying away today, and I don't think it's good or bad, it's just different, but there's a shying away of exposure to things that are going to be upsetting. And, and uh, when we were kids in the 70s and 60s, um, a lot of those bets were off. And uh, you look at something like the original Willy Wonka movie, never can remember if it's Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, or Charlie and the Chocolate One of the other, the one with Gene Wilder, not the one with Johnny Depp. You know, go back and look at that, and you just really ask yourself, you know, what on earth were they thinking? Uh, it's absolutely traumatizing children. One of the reasons the film was not a success is a lot of us think it's because uh, once it started playing on TV at Thanksgiving time, a lot of us were able to relax kids who were terrified of it in the cinemas. Um, and that's maybe one of the reasons why it was more successful. But another one's Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. It's like there's this child catcher and he looks like a demon and he's talking about, I mean, he, he basically uh, kidnaps little kids and they don't really say what's going to happen to them as a result of being kidnapped. You just know that they've been kidnapped and then they find out they're living in a little in a dark, scary cave underneath the castle. And, I mean, it's just, just crazy when you think about what they were doing and uh, not considering you know, sensitive viewers like they would today. Um, and again, I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just talking in terms of yeah, it's a thing. And so uh, Coraline, in my opinion, was kind of a return to, uh, we're just going to go for it and we're just going to, use images that are potentially really scary to little kids and I'm sure they got like a PG rating or something but uh, anyway it's read a lot of horror in elementary I wonder what kind of horror you read in elementary not to get too personal I'm just curious what kind of horror you were reading I've started reading Stephen King in elementary school I read Salem's Lot and The Shining and I remember thinking if my mom knew what I was reading I'm not sure she would actually approve so I think I just won't tell her um, but truth be told, she admitted later, it's like, as long as my kids are reading, I don't care too much what they're reading. I'm like, yeah, I don't know if you, some of the stuff in, particularly in The Shining, might be surprised. Um, but no, I mean, she knew. Uh, and she was like, well, if he's old enough to want to explore it, then he's old enough to maybe have a conversation about it later. Uh, but so, yeah, I'm kind of curious what kind of horror was available to you in the elementary school, if it was Goosebumps or if it was something a little bit more. I mean, even Goosebumps can get kind of, that's just scary stories to tell in the dark. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I got that and right after I moved to LA. I saw that in a bookstore and I was just like, you gotta be kidding me. That's, I mean, I thought it was great, uh, but I'm like, but that's pretty intense for kids. I'm rather surprised what they got away with it. In fact, I think they did actually either consider changing the books or they actually did change the books from the illustrator that originally did them and uh, made them a little more safe. And then I think people cried foul. Uh, and then I, I believe the scary stories are telling the dark that the, uh, the movie kind of used the original illustrator's look to convey the ideas but anyway it's either here or there but yeah goosebumps too okay so yeah cool i mean if if i had been a kid uh, at that time I, I would have just devoured those i'm pretty sure so that's really cool um but hiding with your friends <laughs> that's nice that's really funny yeah so i mean there's it's not really related to anything animation but you know in a minor way it kind of is but but I'm a real big uh, proponent of um, pushing boundaries a little bit that's always what I like to do even when I was a kid with my own artwork was to do things that were different to push boundaries one of the reasons I, I mean, one of the one of the scenes that I did recently that I just finished a couple weeks ago actually right after the new year I believe I shared that one was a scene that was um, referencing Ralph Bakshi's Wizards a little bit and Space Ace a little bit. 
the Don Bluth video game. And those are fairly old references, or ancient references now, but, um, but open up the conversation about uh, what I like to do, uh, which was do things that were a little bit different and not typically Disney maybe. And uh, I was getting back to talking about Del Bear. I was really pleased to see that he shared that. I mean, he was a lot more traditional animation to, than I was uh, at that point. I, mean, I, I was traditional animation when I was a kid, but I kind of grew out of it when my mom and dad dropped us off to see Wizards uh, in the 70s first run and saw that it was this fairly naughty affair. Um, it just changed my life forever, and I knew that I could never go back. And to find out that um, Dale Bear, of all people, kind of felt the same way, that would just made me feel better, um, that, that, that there's room for everybody. And, and that's you know, overall why I bring stuff like this up, too, is to say that, let's say that you have a specific style that you like more than the others, um, and people keep trying to press you and say, no, no, there's only this one style, and that's the best. Um, I think true artists uh, recognize that there's room for everybody in the art world. And a lot of times, just for the record, in my art, in my animation classes, I encourage the students to develop their own style or at least give them a helping hand. Uh, it's also really important to be able to draw, if you're going to do traditional animation, draw in a style that is uh, what the studio is asking of you. You can't um, we, we've been talking about this a lot in class and in our meetings. You can't just go off and do what you want when you're working in a studio. At some point, you have to get good at replicating the style of others. Part of what I'm doing this cat for is when it's done, if all has gone according to plan, if it works, if I, if I do my job correctly, um, it should look like it would exist in a Disney world that it should look like it's uh, if not necessarily an exact scene from the Aristocats with O'Malley, the alley cat, but it's got that Disney feel to it. It's, it's got the flow of a Disney cartoon and the kind of amped up acting that you might find in a Disney feature from certainly from the 70s, um, as opposed to something that you would see, say, from The Simpsons or something that would be uh, seen in anime or you know, any number of other styles uh, by way of talking a little bit about style and how it's important that you, as an animation artist who wants to draw for a living, that you're able to adopt uh, other styles other than the one that you love the best. And it was when I was in art school, I, I would ask that question a lot and just say, well, what what happens is, or when I was talking to animators before I became one, I'd say, well, what happens when you get involved in a scene that you do aren't really interested in the character, you're not interested in the action? Um, how do you handle that when you're being tasked with drawing something that it's not you're not comfortable with or you're not interested in drawing at all? And the answer is a real simple one. And the answer is, is when they're paying you to do it, it makes a big difference, you'll find. Uh, when you're doing animation for a living and that's all you're doing and you're focused on it and they're paying you and you have mentors about everywhere, uh, you'd be amazed how, how your tune changes and how suddenly things that didn't seem like they would be easy to do become much more easy to do. So uh, anyway, um, the question is, is do you... I uh, will at least you said something first. The less kids are exposed to real-life horrors, the more likely they'll experience it because they don't know any better, I'm like talking to strangers. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, so I always say this, I've said this many, many times, but I was getting into children's book illustration briefly many, many years ago, and I went to a conference, and this wonderful speaker got up, and she told us uh, lots of stories, and she concluded, or one of the things she said, I don't know what she said, it's been a million years ago, but she said, uh, something to the effect of, it's important that kids sometimes see this a story, a version of the 101 Dalmatians, where they actually are captured and turned into persons for Cruel de Vil. Because that's an option in life. That's something that can happen. And to, to say that that never happens and that the good guys, the good guys uh, always win is doing a disservice to kids. They need to hear um, 
I mean, she was basically long before the word became a buzzword. She was talking about diversity, and she herself was someone of a diverse nature, and um, she was kind of making a, a plea to encourage um, diversity beyond the what was then considered the typical happy ending Disney uh, story, which is you know to be fair, Disney's really changed a lot, and they they worked really hard at trying to come up with uh, worlds and stories that uh, encourage or display diversity. So I, you got to kind of hand it to them. I, mean, I don't know how much credit you need to give them. It's up to you. But but I think that they've done a really nice job of trying, at least, which is all anybody can do in the end. But anyway, uh, the question is different styles have tried out. Well, um, different styles. I'm currently, believe it or not, I'm currently trying out uh, trying to come up with something that has sort of a dynamic anime style. I was hoping to have that ready for the new year and, and be able to share it and work on that, and that's still coming. But I wanted to take a step back uh, and work on something a little more in my zone. Um, I recently, I think it's safe to announce, not that anybody cares, but I mean, I recently kind of became the head of the animation department, uh, both 2D and 3D, in CG Spectrum and become the animation manager, or want of a better title, um, kind of overseeing production uh, and overseeing the lessons and just the departments and doing a lot of uh, many kind of administrative sort of things. And uh, that's taken me out of the realm of creating content a little bit. So I'm um, relying on projects that are safe and not so much about doing new projects that are going to be a little more difficult for me to do anyway but so to watch this space i'll be working on a really dynamic action anime scene soon uh, sooner than later but uh, for now i'm kind of sticking with my safe tried and true disney ish or disney influenced style um, but other styles that i had to work in um well I mean, most of the time I worked in Disney styles, uh, Disney offshoots, because that's what was popular in the 90s. But put it this way, every single person who interprets the Disney style, including myself, will do it in a slightly different way. And again, take, I said this earlier tonight, um, but take what you like about the style and then toss what you don't like, and then it becomes your own style. And so... Um, I had to work with different artists who had different specific styles and didn't, and had to kind of copy that style. So, for example, um, Swan Princess. I worked for the lead animator Steve Gordon. I believe I can't remember. If he, I think he goes by Steve E. Gordon uh, now, and um, you know, copy his style because I worked directly for him on that film, working on the Rothbart and a couple other characters. When we worked on El Dorado, we had three different animation supervisors. And then they had three different animation cleanup supervisors, and I worked directly for the lead uh, animator, uh, uh, Darley Brewster, um, on that film, and then the lead supervising cleanup person uh, on that on the character of Miguel. And they had very different ideas. Each one of the supervisors had pretty different ideas about um, how the character should look, and uh, they actually made it into the film. There's a little bit of a battle if you look at Miguel from scene to scene. He changes sometimes, and the goal was to make it look like one person had done it all. Um, but being the nature of the film and the time, um, that you know, it's interesting at least to me to look at the film and, and see that there were some different takes on what the character should look like. Um, so I had to adapt my style to the different leads that I would work for on that film, uh, who believed that the character should look different. Um, Miguel, I believe, he was designed by. James Baxter. If it wasn't designed by him, he was actually uh, flourished, fleshed out by James, who then created the model sheets, which we would then use to design the character, or do our, our scenes in, in the movie. Um, so I had to adapt to James Baxter's style, who designed Miguel, and then Darley Brewster's style, who was the head animator on the character. And then there were two other heads of animation on the character that also had distinctive ideas about, you know, how the character should look. And depending on who I was working for, I had to adapt to their style. So it isn't really a, a specific style um, 
you know, that's unique. It still kind of falls within the Disney style, but it was different uh, challenges. And then, you know, each film I worked on, and you, like, for example, I worked for Kathy Zielinski on Hunchback, and she had a lot to say about the character of Frollo. And so we had to spend weeks learning how to draw that character to make it look like she had drawn the whole thing herself, which she practically did anyway. No, that's a disservice to all the animators who worked on that film, excellent animators that I got to work with. Um, but it, the idea was to make it look like one person drew the whole thing. And just so you guys know, I mean, the reasoning behind that too is just so that you as an audience member are not thinking about the technique if you're a good animation student, then at some point you're going to be thinking about the technique and trying to figure out how they did it. But um, as somebody who's just entertained by animated films, the goal is to not be thinking about those things and just get caught up in the entertainment of it all. And uh, that's why we would work for weeks and weeks trying to match the style of whoever was uh, in charge of the film look and whoever the animator was. And that is what you'll find is the case with anime is, you know, it has a specific set of rules and you have to follow those rules. And that's how it ends up looking like um, this particular style it did. And little things that I do, maybe you've been seeing me do this today, is I draw a mask, and not so much in the breakdowns, but in the in-betweens, but I will you know, draw a mask and that mask will help me inform, help inform me where certain things are, like where to draw the eyes and how far to make them apart from each other and depending on what kind of character it is what the eye style is and then you know where to put the nose and where to put the eyebrows and all this is like the, that's a disney thing it's they kind of developed this idea and the roundness of them I'm not doing the best job of it but you get the idea um and and the little flourishes and things those are all big like i draw very much, I spent many, many hours trying to copy the Don Bluth style. I'm pretty rusty nowadays, but uh, but you know, it's just practice it for years and years. So, so my stuff ends up looking kind of like a hybrid of Don Bluth and I don't know what Bakshi, I guess. Um, and then mixed with my own filter, but uh, but that was like that was a, a style that was in pressed upon us, those of us who wanted to make our stuff look a specific way. And so if you like the anime style, you're going to practice doing it the way that uh, others have done it, the experts, the masters in that field. And that then becomes uh, rules that you have to follow if you want it to look a certain way, which again is something that we teach, um, whether we're teaching you anime styles or what, but it is something that you, you learn through doing. So. Anyway, I don't know if that really actually uh, answered the question, but uh, but that's the, the long answer is, is that, yeah, you just practice a lot. It's mind-blowing so many animators come up on a film and a series and make it look so congruent. Yeah, yeah well, that's what they pay them. <laughs> and that's why uh, someday, you know, maybe animation will get so easy, you just have to push a button and it just comes. But at that point, it's not necessarily worth as much either. Um, and the reason it's worth something is because People who are really animation students spend a lot of time learning how to draw and a lot of time learning how to draw in different styles. And, uh, and, and that's worth something. And it should be worth something because uh, it, it's not something just anybody can do. So uh, so that's, that's why you uh, train and practice and, and try you know, different experiments with this stuff. Uh, so anyway, we're just about out of time here. We've got just a few minutes left until I'm going to uh, go away for another week. Um, here, I'm just letting this play now for a while. This is how far I got with this for tonight. I'm, I think that's about it for the uh, breakdowns that I was going to do and, and a lot of the in-betweens. So next up, now that I've gone through this um, off screen, probably I'm going to go through and fix this up a little bit, make some final choices about how I want it to look as far as rough animation goes, but that's um, that's the gist of it. I've done all the chart charted drawings now. It's tweaks and things that I want to do to fix up volumes and overlap and just anything that I just am not happy with. Uh, there's lots of stuff that I'm going to fix. Um, maybe I'll talk about that next week, um, but next week I'll start cleaning it up and uh, moving towards finishing this off. 
uh, and then, like I said, then I'll put a background behind it, do some, maybe some tones and highlights and, and all that. So in the next couple of weeks, I'll be cleaning it up and then hope to finish this one real quick and then I'm going to get on to another scene. Uh, but uh, oh, thanks, Vanessa. I'm glad that your cat approves. <laughs> That's great. Cat tried and tested. Um, but uh, as I always say, at this point, if there's anything else you're interested in as far as animation goes, specifically 2D for me, you can always ask. Uh, come, I can come prepared with things if you uh, are interested in anything specific. I always like talking about um, job-related stuff. How do I get a job? How do I set up my portfolio? Um, how do I network? How do I make contacts? I'm always happy to talk about that sort of thing. Uh, so come prepared with questions uh, if you like, and I will um, try to address those things in these streams if you're interested. Uh, and then also there are other streams available, as I mentioned before, if you're interested in concept art, that's a really hot one. They're all good, but um, you know a lot of people are interested in painting, digital painting, and that sort of thing. Um, well, John Skull, that's exactly what I was going for to make it look like a Disney film, so thanks. <laughs> Whether that's true or not, I appreciate you saying so. Um, there are other streams, there are other departments. You'll find it all at cgspectrum.com. Uh, so feel free to, everybody wants to be a pet. I think it was everybody wants to be a cat, but yeah, that's exactly. Um, but uh, so thank you for uh, sharing this time for me with me, those of you who are here today. Uh, always appreciate that, uh, your company. Always appreciate you asking questions. And I hope you guys had a good time. I will be back here same time, same place. Thanks, John School. Uh, I'll be uh, here same time, same place next week with more animation fun. Uh, or you can check out some of the other streams or be sure and check out cgspectrum.com if you want to know anything more about the school and what we do. Uh, and like I said, uh, sign up for the uh, 2D animation program with our anime mentor if you're interested. Uh, it's going to go real quick once they put the advertising out officially. But you saw it here first, folks. Um, other than that, that's it from me for today. Have a great rest of the day or night, depending on where you are in the world. And a great rest of the week. And uh, look forward to seeing you again sometime. If you want to stop by, uh, stop by and say hi next time we're doing this. But other than that, that's me, Scott Claus, signing off for another live stream for cgspectrum.com. Uh, take care. See you next time.